Taking us to lands of wonder filled with imagination, today we're going to explore the excitement behind the creation of video games. I'm Noah Kittle, and welcome to My World Science. Have you ever wondered how games go from idea to completion? The process is game development. And here to help us unravel the mysteries of game development is Philippe Paquet from the Activision company who created the Call of Duty series. Welcome to Cape of Studios. Thank you so much, Thank Noah. you. It's a pleasure to yes. be here. I would like to start off with, of course, your background. Uh, because game development is a relatively new franchise, so. A new field. Field, yes, that's a better word. Yes. Field. So, um, what brought you into it? it it's a mix of uh, different uh, disciplines. You, you mix at the same time art, like uh, animation, graphics, and uh, you're mixing uh, computer science, and uh, actually classical science as well. Ah, okay. So, for example, in classical science, you will have uh, things like uh, physics. We do physics simulation, or uh, we simulate the way light uh, responds to uh, the eye. When, uh, when you were in school, they, did they have any kind of like computer science or maybe even game development classes, or was that, did that come about after school passed? Oh, uh, that was the very beginning of uh, computer scientist school. So there was the first uh, classes, but the school at the time were uh, just setting up computers and the professor were uh, learning how to teach uh, computing okay. at the time. So I did a little bit of computing at school, but uh, I went on my own because I was passionate about that, and I learned a lot on my own, on the top of what I will uh, learn after high school. Um, how long were you at Activision since starting? I've been at Activision for nearly five years. Nearly five years, wow. Were you at any other companies before that? I did. Uh, I did. I worked for the Walt Disney Company oh. for a period of time, like nearly seven years. And uh, before that, I, op I worked for the new version of uh, Atari. Ah, okay. There was an original Atari company from the 1980s right. uh, that went bankrupt, and it okay. was uh, bought by a French company called Infogram that I was working for. So I worked with them for uh, over 10 years before uh, moving to the United States and working for the Walt Disney Company. Wow, you, so you had a lot of background before getting into Activision. So I know that you work in the Call of Duty side of Activision, that's correct? I, I do, I do mostly uh, work on Call of Duty. We do also uh, have other projects uh, we released this year Sekiro, which was a, a publishing right. deal. Uh, so we worked with an external developer uh, and brought their product to market. Uh, and we have other uh, games that we are developing in-house, like uh, Spyro the Dragon, Crash That's Bandicoot. Right. Uh, and Crash Bandicoot has different facets. There's a classic platform games, but there's also the racing games, for example. I kind of like the... Uh, the um juxtaposition of how Activision makes, you know, Call of Duty and then you have Spyro and Crash Bandicoot, like they're complete polar opposites, but I guess that just shows how broad uh, game companies can be. Um, Activision is, is it conjoined with Blizzard? Yes, it's actually part of a, a group, uh, Activision, Blizzard and King. So ah, okay. Blizzard Entertainment does a big game like uh, World of Warcraft or Overwatch. Yes. And uh, we have also part of the family, uh, King Games, which does a mobile phone game like uh, Candy Crush. Okay. Oh, oh, oh that King. <laughs> that King. Th that, uh, that King. King Games. Ah, okay. Yes. Um, right. So the, the Call of Duty games come out about once a year? So that's right. We have, for the last uh, seven, ten years, been able to release a new game every year. But of course, the production of a game does not fit into one year, right? So that means you would have to work on games overlapped. Exactly. 
Uh, so it takes about three years to make a Call of Duty game. So over a, a period of three years, you will have three different studios that will be working in parallel uh, to produce one game every year. Is that uh, three years including just coming up with the idea of the game, or is that three years after like all the um, designs are created? Or I guess that would be part of the three so years? That would be part of the three years. So they, they will do a design phase at the beginning, but uh, our team are very experienced. Yeah. So when they finish a game, they usually have a good idea of where they want to go for ah, the okay. next game and they know which game mechanic work, what was fun in the previous game, and uh, what they can uh, improve on. Okay, very, very planned ahead, I suppose. And during the development of these games, you would, of course, need to have professionals in different fields to make sure the game itself is kind of accurate to the real world, because Call of Duty takes place in a fictitious, but it's still Earth. Yeah, exactly. So the, the story is totally fictitious, yeah. but to get you to believe that you're in uh, the real world, we need to get elements of the real world. So we need to get the geography right, we need to get the language right, and even the culture, the yeah. ambience of certain environments have to match reality to create an uh, illusion and to be able to, for you to uh, suspend disbelief and be immersed in the action of the story. Right. So yeah, you would need uh, culture professionals, probably exactly. historians? We do uh, use historians, we do use consultants that are uh, specialists of their different cultures okay. to make things accurate. Uh, we worked on the geography of things. Uh, so it's a world number of uh, disciplines that the design team and the art team will be uh, able yeah. to work with and get uh, knowledge from. And of course, Call of Duty is very physics-based, I would say, just because there's projectiles flying everywhere. And um, that means you would have to have a physics, maybe not a physics department, but you know, you would probably have like a team of <laughs> physicists to check everything is correct. We do have a, a team that is specialized in physics. Ah, okay. So they do both computer science and physics. So they know enough of uh, Newtonian physics to be able to create a simulation and uh, write a code that will uh, make that simulation work. Right, because the simulations have to run in real time, that's correct? That's correct. Yeah, you can't just run the simulation once and then copy it everywhere. Everything has to smoothly blend together in the chaos, I guess, of the game, right? That's right. For, for certain games, uh, if you have a very fixed path, you can pre-compute a lot of things. But uh, a game like uh, Call of Duty, where you have a lot of freedom, uh, you cannot pre-compute anything. So you will have to run the physics simulation in real time. You will have to run the rendering in real time. Uh, the artificial intelligence for your adversary in real time, and even the sound mixing is done in real time. So wow. the audio will change depending on the action and depending on what you're doing. Ah, uh, you're right. Yeah, the sound. I forgot about. I forgot that sound is also physics fundamentally, and how. Yeah. The, okay. <laughs> so the sound is a very important uh, component of a game that is about fighting at a mm -hmm. large scale because the sounds can tell you where your enemies are. Right. So uh, that uh, component has a simulation that is accurate. So you, you will be able to hear an enemy coming from where they're coming from. Uh, plus there's a general ambiance, depending on the type of room that you're in, or if you're outdoor, there may be less echo, depending on the materials around you. And would you need someone who kind of knows what sounds animals make at all? Because you were just saying about if you were in a forest, I mean, would they put the time in to put the sounds of like creatures or is it kind of just like a war zone? Uh, of course, the, <laughs> we have sound engineers that are uh, very similar to what the movie industry uh, Ooh, does. That's pretty cool. So they, they would go and record sounds in uh, different places uh, to have accuracy. 
So for a game like Call of Duty, uh, we will have our sound engineer go to the range and record the actual guns to know uh, what they sound like. Ah, yes. And uh, uh, to, pro to be able to provide uh, ac accurate uh, sound depiction in the game. Yes. And another, I guess another part that has to be uh, simulated properly is, I think I have a better picture, yeah, is of course the explosions. I mean, because an explosion is a shockwave, which can also produce, well, a shockwave sound. It emits light everywhere, emits particles everywhere. Is there like an entire team just for explosions? Or? There are uh, people specialized in special effects. Wow. Okay. So we do have certain programmers that will work on, uh, on the tool and on the engine component to do uh, a special effect like explosion. And uh, you will have certain artists that are specialized in uh, producing the visual of the special effects. Mm. So we will build tool uh, to give to the artist and the artist will be able to tweak uh, how they want the depiction to be. And uh, from there, uh, the game will simulate that in real time. Wow, yes. Let's see, I think I also have a, yeah, exactly. I have a, <laughs> I have a picture of a tank uh, that you have on the website. And I brought it up because we don't, it's probably a lot harder to get information about tanks just because, like, I'm sure there's more gun ranges than tank ranges. <laughs> so that means you would probably have to have quite a few military professionals in the production of the game, and I guess also for the coordination of the movement of the characters. We, we do uh, consult uh, with a military professional. So the, we will have consultants coming that are uh, ex-military special forces that will explain how the, they will actually move on the ground and uh, that way we can model the story of the game and the movement of the character in the game to something that is realistic. Uh, one thing that just came to my mind actually is would you have specialists who know how the human body works to simulate properly uh, the effects of getting shot in certain places? <laughs> uh, it's a bit more complicated than that. So for f when you're getting shot, what we are doing is uh, called a ragdoll simulation. Yes. So we will have a physical simulation uh, linked to a model of a body that's in physics that will replicate the impact of a, a bullet, for example. Mm -hmm. We may have uh, our artist go to a motion capture set and uh, simulate some impact, like they would uh, use rope or push someone right. and capture the motion of that person falling, for example. So, and they, they will uh, uh, later use a blend of the physics simulation we provide and their capture plus their artistic sense to produce a mix of all of that for something that would be that look realistic, but that is cinematic at the same time. Yeah, cinematic, because like you even mentioned earlier, how you have a teams that movie makers also have. Of it's course. The, <laughs> the video game industry has gotten so good at simulating what life looks like that now you have to actually almost treat it like a movie in some ways, making it look good from all angles. And the video game industry, of course, is larger than the movie industry at this point, that's correct. Yeah, at this point, uh, if you look at the global revenue, uh, the video game industry is larger than the movie industry, the video, TV, uh, the music, and uh, the sports together. Wow. So we, uh, we have very large global audience that no other media is able to reach. I'm curious now, because I thought about you know global, uh, globalization, I realized that these games can be basically administered anyway with internet connection. That got me thinking about the internet. So, do you are you ever involved with having to figure out any errors or not errors, but any problems that might arise with having to deal with the internet connections of yes. the servers? Uh, ooh, can you tell us about that? Yes, yes, yes. No, uh, when you work on a g game on a global scale. Uh, you have certain particular problems that uh, make you 
take account of things like geography and even uh, geopolitics. Oh. So uh, we have servers all over the world uh, for our players to play together. And uh, when we match players together, we need to have a set of criteria. So the geography is one of the criteria. So mm -hmm. which uh, the place you are living in, where your uh, internet connection is, is one of the criteria. But you also have to take in account uh, geopolitics. So mm -hmm. in the Middle East, you could have countries that are next to each other, but that don't have direct internet connection. Uh, okay. uh, so if we wanted to connect players that are very uh, close in terms of geography, uh, their internet connection will go, for example, through Europe or through India. Okay. So we have to know the internet on a large scale. We have to work with certain internet providers to make sure that uh, the traffic for our game is uh, flowing properly. And we have to account about uh, a lot of uh, little information like how countries are interconnected with each other because our players are there, which uh, language our players uh, are using. So you could be close to someone uh, in another country in terms of geography, but if you both are speaking different language, maybe you're not a good match to play together. Right, yeah, that can be, that can be an error, especially now I just realized Europe is pretty compact in, in its countries and also has different languages across each uh, country, which means that you probably, do you have a translation system in the game or no? We don't. We don't. Yeah. Uh, okay. We don't. It's a, it's a very hard problem that uh, technology companies are just working Still on. trying to work out, yeah. Uh, but uh, we do work with linguists. Oh. Uh, our game is translated in, I think, 43 languages. 43. So uh, we have to take in account uh, all those different languages. And uh, not all of them, for example, are written from left to right. Some That's of them, right. like uh, Hebrew or Arabic, will be from uh, right to left. So when you write uh, code for the user interface, you have to take in account all the cultural differences in terms of uh, languages and uh, be, be ready to uh, s like provide something that works for everybody. Uh, let's see, so you've played, not played, but you've worked in Activision for four, almost five years now, which means you've certainly worked on more than one game. I did. <laughs> and I was wondering if there's any uh, really unique stories that you actually have from working there, like if there was some kind of error that a lot of you had to figure out how to solve and then finally somebody did, or just some kind of monumental moment. We, we, we do have uh, moments every year. Every year. Uh, a game like uh, Call of Duty is a very complex piece of technology with a lot of uh, moving parts. You have a lot of uh, art assets, uh, a gigantic art team mm -hmm. that is producing that, animators, artists. Uh, you have the sound team, you have the design team, uh, and you, you have a lot of programmers as well. And that's all of those people working together and trying to get the best game uh, to go out at a certain date. It's really, really hard, especially when you have uh, a lot of content. So in Call of Duty, you have uh, usually a campaign mode, which That's could right. be a game on its own. And there's a zombie game, which could That's be right. a game on its own. And then we have multiplayer. Mm -hmm. And uh, last year we introduced a game mode called Warzone, which is uh, like a very large map multiplayer mode. So every time you're introducing something as big as that, it's a lot of additional work. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not like traditional software development, right. where you, you know exactly what your finished product will be. Uh, for game development, it needs to be fun. So you're going to try something and maybe it's not fun and you have to change oh, it, yeah. and you have to tweak it. And even after you launch, you're going to have to make modification so everything works smoothly. Uh, it's millions of lines of code. Uh, oh, sure. So there's a lot of problems. And uh, you can have uh, problems just on the internet as well. So every launch is uh, challenging. Yeah, wow. That just, that just shows how <laughs> how much really needs to go into these 
video games because in the past and uh, like mobile games too, in the past games used to be way simpler just because the technology that we had available was also simpler. So there actually weren't as many options that we could do with it. But now there's basically an infinite amount of options we have possible. And so the bar for uh, excellence is raised much higher. And I guess that's kind of the, the importance of having gigantic teams, having gigantic budgets, because if you don't have those kind of teams and budgets, then the game's not even going to be popular in the first place. Well, you, you could do some simplistic game, uh, but you are right, not on, uh, right, uh, indie on, games. Not on console. So there's a, an indie game scene that is uh, very vibrant. And uh, it's possible to do things simplistic on mobile phone, yeah. for example. Uh, but if you're going on a video game console, like the one from Sony yeah, or Microsoft, uh, the competition is really hard. So the amount you have to create, the world you have to create, uh, are very, very complex. Mm -hmm. So you're right on that. Yes. Think. Ask how um, to get started. Like for your fellow classmates, ah, okay, okay. like if you have interest in video game development, what should they study? What's a good path to get started? That of course would get cut out, but you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, how would somebody, what would somebody have to do to get started in game development? Because now that it's progressed to a point, it can certainly be more difficult than it was 20 years ago. Of course, so th there is multiple paths. Uh, you, you can start learning on your own. There are resources on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of uh, game engine you can get for free and work with. Uh, but there's also a uh, university program. Like there are local universities in the Los Angeles area, like USC, that has a game development program that will uh, teach you uh, how to make a game more in uh, details and you, uh, you will be able to work with a group of people to do that. Wow. So uh, we have a few people uh, coming from the, uh, that kind of uh, background. Uh, but mm. the common thing is the passions. If you want to do it, if you're really passionate about that, that makes a big difference. Yes, passion. Passion is extremely important for everything, and games no different. In fact, probably especially Wow, because there's probably a ton of competition in terms of the passion department. <laughs> wow. And uh, you have to be passionate in uh, multiple directions. You have to be passionate about the game. Yes. But you also have to be passionate about the exact disciplines that you're going to work on. Mm -hmm. Are you passionate about games and art as well? Or animation, or sound design, or uh, programming? Right, yeah. Or, or even uh, physics. Saying. Games is basically kind of like an umbrella where everything underneath, there's actually many different subdivisions and specializing in those subdivisions can actually bring you into game development. Um, exactly. Tiny side note, that's why I like USC. <laughs> because the USC game development is sectioned as art as well as computer science. So that way, those who do not really know coding much can still participate in game design because designing is kind of the art component and then coding is the the building component. Exactly. But uh, even uh, when you're coding, there's many ways to do things. So yes. if you have an artistic uh, t interest, it helps. It helps uh, in terms of creativity. It's uh, problem solving and you can have creative solutions. Mm -hmm. So having interest in uh, more than just the art science is a, uh, is a plus if you're going to the video game industry. I just want to say thank you, Philip, for coming here today. That was so cool having somebody from such a large video game company actually speak here because I'm sure tons of people would love to hear what you have to say and probably the other hundreds <laughs> that you work with as well. Uh, I'm very lucky. I work with a lot yeah. of uh, very talented people. Okay. Thank you for joining us today on My World Science. If you wish to see more of our content, subscribe to YouTube and check us out on Twitter and Instagram at MyWorldScience. Until next time, think inquisitively.